Hey guys, this is Emma, Vivo Barefoot's Head of Sustainability, and I f***ing hate the word sustainability. Join me as I talk to a whole bunch of people way smarter than me about how we're all going to make regeneration the new normal. Hey guys, welcome to the Vivo Barefoot Regeneration broadcast. Our guest today is Alice Wilby. We had the pleasure of meeting last year at the UK Parliament's Environmental Audit Committee where they were starting a very bold uh, investigation into what a number of the fashion brands were doing in regards to environmental issues and business practice in general. Um, And we both have spent some time since then looking into various follow-up issues and, and yourself, Alice, you spent some time with Extinction Rebellion setting up a really strong, sustainable fashion. So I hopefully that can work its way into some of our conversation today. I guess the first question is, what role do you think those big brands are having on the kind of culture at the moment around COVID-19? And how have you seen their behaviour affect the industry, the fashion industry right now and, and the fashion industry in the future? Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think um, one of the first things I've been really fascinated to see emerge is that in an emergency situation like this, we see just how non-vital fashion and apparel actually is. So all the focus of, is, of course, on rushing to the aid, the um, the wonderful work being done by all of our emergency services and the NHS. Um, we've seen kind of globally lots of brands from like LVMH turning their perfume uh, sort of manufacturing into making hand sanitizer for the French French hospitals. And we've seen lots of designers offering up their services to make um, masks and kind of protective equipment. And so it sort of, first off, it demonstrates that, you know, in an emergency situation, and this is something that we have been sort of relating as the fashion action team within XR, is fashion an emergency? Um, is it a necessity? And in an emergency like this, we see that it's not. But we've also seen some kind of really, you know, this interesting polarisation between brands who actually do want to do something really positive and brands who, again, just are showing that they really don't care about their workforce. We had Nike, very interestingly, you know, Nike have been on a massive sort of journey of rebranding and sustainability and ethics and really after so many disasters, really having to go to their core and kind of and work out how they can turn their business around. And they have, they were really, really early to shut their doors to send all their workforces home. The CEOs of Nike have donated about 10 million, I think, from their personal Oh, wow, well, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, they're donating to community funds that support um, sort of health and social services and uh, humanitarian efforts. So they, you know, they're doing huge things to support the communities of their workers and the communities of their customers in this time of COVID. That's a really incredible thing. And I, it's maybe going to the kind of level 10 question I already want to get, get to on the <laughs> podcast. But I think one of the really interesting reasons I got into the industry, at least, was because of influence that these brands can have on culture. I'd be interested to hear from you in terms of, is that why you think this is a really important part of Extinction Rebellion and and the future of our society? And do you feel strongly around that cultural influence that that fashion has? I've been working in sustainable fashion for the last 10 years. And I was, I sort of joined the sustainable fashion industry as a stylist, really looking to see how I could platform sustainable fashion in a really cool and interesting way. Because 10 years ago, it was still looking a little kind of oatmeal around the edges and so I was really aware of you know this sort of transformative power of fashion and messaging and media and how we could actually can we you know can we harness sustainable fashion to and it's it's powerful stories to make a difference in the in the world of commerce and consumption and I think that's happened to a certain extent but what we've seen is loads of co-opting and greenwashing which I know you're you know really passionate about fighting against but back to your question in this in this kind of situation you know the power of the power of brands, not just through their how they deal with their supply chains, their workers, and their CSR, you know, commitments. How they use their branding and their messaging and their power to affect positive change. And you know, I, I would have I would have laughed ten years ago if you told me I'd be talking positively about Nike right now. But if you look at how Nike have really holistically put their workers and their community and their health front and foremost 
in comparison with Adidas, who just weeks after Nike had already sent all of their workers home. So we have, you know, we have these two very polarizing positions that brands are taking. I know today in the news, Primark, which is a fast fashion giant in the UK, who I had the pleasure of working for for some time, they have now made the front page news today for deciding to pay some of the orders for suppliers. And I know some of the people that I'm still friends with from there are quite upset with the fact that you're allowed to get front page news for that action, even though that action came about from a huge backlash and a huge protest from the consumer groups more broadly um, and the supply chain around the decision to cancel those orders in the first place. I know you've done a lot of work with Extinction Rebellion to try and drive this industry in the right direction. Do you feel like you have to celebrate those wins when you get them and just be happy that the change happened, even if it happened in a circumstance where you don't really feel like that behaviour was happening for the right reasons? One of our first campaign that we ran last summer um, was a boycott fashion initiative, which garnered a lot of attention and we were you know one of the questions was what about the workers and we've always advocated for um for the for the best treatment of workers throughout the supply chain what what the conversation we were driving about was about was you know overconsumption and mass consumption and how that is so environmentally detrimental and that we have to change fundamentally change business models in order to combat climate crisis yeah, I mean, it's an interesting position because I do, I'm actually delighted that they're paying something. They should be paying everything. We've never advocated for a situation like this. When we were talking about systemic change, one of the things we've adv- always advocated for um, is a just transition of jobs. And that's across all in industry. That's not just in, you know, unique to fashion. We're going to need a, a, a real serious look at how we work. You know, when you're advocating for this change and you're I mean, you have a wonderful gift to simplify what's right, you know, what the right decision is in a lot of these situations. And do people push back on you and say, well, that's all well and good, but how do we actually do that? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's really complex. And, you know, that's, that's nice that you say that, that I can simplify things because sometimes I think that we, we absolutely have to simplify things because things have become so convoluted and messy Look at the complex webs we've woven with our global supply chains. It's no surprise that it's people are kind of saying, well, how on earth do we pick these things apart? Mm. I honestly don't have the sort of 10 commandments to follow at the moment. But what we have to do is have really honest conversations. And therefore, that's why it's really good to simplify things, to say that the system we're in is so broken. Like it's it's not working. And we have we have to we have to make radical change. And I think another another thing to add to that is that radical change is coming whether we like it or not. So we have two options, I think. We either do nothing, run around like headless chickens, argue about what the best procedure to follow is and then take no action. And Mother Nature takes its course and we end up in, you know, three to five degrees predicted global heating by the end of the century. Or we go, okay, right, this is really bloody difficult, but let's let's think really radically and take some radical action. I almost feel like the way that the COVID crisis has become such a universal topic so rapidly was because of the fact that it was somewhat simple. It was this, cri- you know, that we've known this we're in crisis for a while, but this was an element of the crisis that was here, it was on our doorstep, and we could get our hands around it, and we could understand that it was this thing we needed to, you know, fight it. We needed to to address it, and you know, and therefore everyone was able to mobilize. And you touched on it when you're talking about, you know, it's coming whether you like it or not. Do you feel like how the world has shown it can mobilize itself is now a really good example of how we can face that? What's next? Yeah, absolutely. The thought a year ago of asking people to work from home more and to to work from home more and to restrict their travel and to basically put quite massive restrictions on their lifestyle in aiding fighting a a sort of, you know, a larger enemy and sort of winning a bigger goal was unthinkable. And now people actually have something that is relatable, that they can, you know, that's relatable that's happened in their lifetime. There's a really interesting article in The Independent um, just come out reporting back from some of the participants of the People's Assembly that's now happening. 
this has been one of the three asks from Extinction Rebellion, which is that once the government have told the truth and communicated the uh, details of the climate crisis, that it pulls together a cross-section of British society that meet once a week, with, um, informed by a panel of experts, and they debate what they think the best solutions and way forward are for us as a society, uh, politically, um, financially, uh, to deal with the climate crisis. What has been coming out of that, this, this article, and it was di linked, directly linked to the experiences that the participants were having under the umbrella of COVID, was, I mean, everything we've just been discussing, that, that people were saying, you know, it's really interesting that this has happened whilst we are having this people's assembly before COVID and having to work from home. I wouldn't have thought that it would be possible. And the, the voices that were coming out were just, you know, wishing that other people could be there and that this knowledge could be shared really widely. But the uh, all of the recordings of all of the people's assembly so far are available to download. So in effect, we can we can all participate in this process. How wonderful. It comes back to something you and I were discussing the other night, actually, about, I'm going to be really frank here, I'm really bored of the discussion in the fashion industry because of the fact that I think we keep seeking those fix-all solutions or we keep yeah. expecting someone else to fix the problems. And I feel like there's this please consume less message going out to a huge millions of people across the world that aren't really interested in receiving that message. And it can be really terribly disheartening. And I, um, I've spoken to you before around trying to create a tipping point around courage. Yeah. And I'm trying to brand that up a little bit because I'm really keen to, um, to find a community across the world that is very Extinction Rebellion in its nature, but is very, very keen to just connect off each other and thrive off each other and learn off each other. And not everyone is anti-business. Not everyone is kind of anti um, anti-establishment, which of course I know that that is not Extinction Rebellion, but it is largely how they are perceived by many people in the world. And I think that a lot of people are keen for the spirit of Extinction Rebellion, but still very, very interested to stay in the job they're in right now or, or continue on the career path that they have. And, and so I find myself increasingly in a space where I'm trying to give guts to people to tell the story, to, to really make sure that when they're seeing something happening, that they're they're airing that. I, I heard a quote this morning, which was about, um, I think it basically goes, if you walk past a behavior, you're condoning that behavior. And I find that that is one of the things from my perspective that's holding us back to that real end goal, that end vision. So I, um, how are you working both at the university and with Extinction Rebellion to try and push forward that movement and, and create much more energy around wanting to, you know, wanting to bring people on that journey with you? So I teach a short course in sustainable fashion at St. Martin's, funnily enough, with Claire Farrell, who is one of the co-founders of Extinction Rebellion. So our lectures are often quite, not hardcore, that's the wrong word, but we are, we are sort of purists in a sense in that we, are, we don't shy away from delivering really difficult information. We also give them lots of wonderful, empowering stuff to take away, but we also, we also give them the kind of hard line. And one of those hard lines unfortunately is in this larger conversation, not necessarily in my course lecture, but in this larger conversation is that some jobs are just not fit for purpose for the, for the future. Mm. And some jobs are just going to have to go. So one of the things we have watched with joyfully with the work we've been doing with the fashion action team is that last year we were calling for, we wrote a letter to the British Fashion Council asking them if they would cancel Fashion Week and use the platform to communicate the climate crisis and they declined and specified just how important it is to keep the shows running and why and you know obviously a lot of that is underpinned with commerce which is a key driver of climate change and one of the reasons that the fashion industry is intrinsically um, linked to climate crisis and we kind of come full circle now to Vogue hosting series of um, online debates and conversations about the future of Fashion Week and should Fashion Week be taken online? And I believe it was Mark Jacobs who said something along the lines of, you know, we, we, oh, we don't need to show any more than two times a year. It's quite frankly exhausting. We're making far too much stuff that people do not need. And he's ba he basically said, I am fed up with creating products that people do not want or need. Thank you. This is, this is, this is, these are the kind of voices we need. And we've seen this in the years running up to this. We've seen 
so many designers and heads of company kind of burn out and crash or can just abdicate from their positions because they are under so much pressure to create so many collections and they physically can't cope. So you see that on one end and then you see consumers on the other end who are so overstimulated and start being sold so much stuff and we are drowning in the next and the new and fashion by its very definition is about change. Fashion very, by its very definition is about next and zeitgeist and visionary ideas. So let's harness that, you know, back to your question about what do I, the, the potential for the fashion industry. I think what we have is a, is a really powerful industry of creative minds, problem solvers, inventors, and many people who really passionately care about the environment. We've been on the phone and on Zoom with press agencies all around the world talking to them about our approach for this. And they couldn't understand why we, you know, we almost weren't going for that traditional kind of greenwashing tail, you know, littered in green coloured font that we <laughs> sees. Um, and actually they came back to me this morning, got a very funny email this morning at four o'clock in the morning saying, can you please give us a really long list of how we can recognize greenwashing during this Earth Day week, which I thought was really fascinating. You know, that's culture change, right, in the right yes. area. And even the way that we've built this podcast series up towards um, donating to rewilding projects, you know, the amount of work we had to do on the commercial end to try and model that so it wasn't steering consumers directly back to buying a shoe because that's not why we're doing it. That's really interesting. I mean, that just shows you how we've built a culture that is completely centered around sales. And even for a brand like yours, who is about fundamentally born out of a passion for humanity and health and nature, you look at it, it's a similar, similar parallels with Patagonia, you know, companies that, that, uh, that care about the natural environment, but within the structure, the global kind of um, uh, structure that we, we operate in, uh, come down to sales. That's really fascinating. But you're playing with the big boys, right? And I think that's ultimately why we're trying to do this podcast, because we can only go so far and then it's the industry and, you know, that the influence that the industry has on how it works and how it does business. At the end of the day, we can have all the greatest ethics in the world, but if we're not in business, then we can't, we've got nowhere to share those ethics. We can't make an influence. So you do have to play the game some days, but most of the time I can really hand on heart say that the company will, you know, take its hat off and walk all, work all night to try and make sure that we are, you know, absolutely doing the right thing. And, and like you say yourself, it always is a journey. You're never going to be perfect from the get-go anyway. So coming out the back of this lockdown, what advice would you have for small brands and visionary brands like Vivo Barefoot to take on regeneration is a really fundamental part of their business. There's so many of the innovators who have got the really kind of like visionary approach get squashed and pushed out by the larger competition who don't, who, you know, don't care. I think what we are seeing and what we will have to see is a shift in brand identity and brand purpose, mm -hmm. massive shift in brand purpose. So, you know, I've sort of joked before that I think just certain massive brands would continue to exist if they had to if they had to carry on doing business as a as a branded coffee shop and not sell luxury handbags anymore they'd be quite happy as long as they had the market share and their brand identity and i think we have to as a whole reframe um who the main shareholder is in all of our businesses it's got to be nature it's got to be mother earth we've got to work with mother earth as the as the sort of as the shareholder this has been this has been um sort of pissing me off for quite a while that um, Notre Dame went up in flames last year. We saw this huge outpouring of resources from, um, you know, major fashion houses, LVMA, Caring, for example. Uh, I think they pledged about 300 million between them, 300 million euros. And of course, you know, it was a heartbreaking to watch an icon iconic building burned down like that. But at the time I was thinking, our fucking planet is burning. Our home is burning around us. We are literally, like the world is literally on fire. Why are you not donating to that? As, as these massive conglomerates, you have plundered the earth for such a long time, taking its natural resources and making loads of products that people don't want. Mm -hmm. up in landfill and 
don't, aren't recyclable. There's no closed loop. The majority of it hasn't been designed or grown in any kind of regenerative way. And, you know, the, this, this, this sort of sentiment that was poured out to, to fund and support the rebuilding of this, you know, arguably beautiful and important landmark. Where is the money? Where's the money for climate crisis? Where's the money to support Earth? Where's the money for Earth Week? Why, you know, where, where are the, why are the funds not there for that? Right. And it's really interesting, again, you know, back to what Nike have just done, that, that brands can utilise uh, their power and, and, and really look at what they're doing as a business. The only brands that can use their power like that are the ones that already had it in place. Like it can't yes. be a reactive thing. If your culture is not complementary to regeneration, to, you know, nurturing the environment and nurturing people's health and communities, then you aren't going to be able to react that way. I feel like unless we're really willing to have those hard conversations you mentioned um, and to really, you know, support and get behind those companies that are behaving in the, in the way that you just described then, in terms of Nike and, and really embracing the community and, and um, you know, leading by example, that I, I'm going to fail to get out the back of this and hope that we aren't just going to see, you know, Venice become, you know, the waters in Venice become dark again and airlines taking off again and, and everything going back to the way it was. We need a shakedown. We need a complete systemic shakedown and reshaping. I mean, we, you know, talking about you're talking about culture and culture in business in, in in the companies. You're absolutely right. You know, I've spoken to people who used to work at Topshop and describe the anxiety that they would feel when they knew Philip Green was coming into the office, and the body shaming and the outfit shaming and the the negativity that he would he would single people out and direct at them, and that's from the boss of your company. When, and you're working for a company that's all about envisaging beautiful fashion to empower young women, and he's degrading his female staff. How do you deal with the fact that a lot of the people that you teach them, they aren't really aware of that? Because I hear over and over again, no, can we please just, no positive news, let's talk about all the wonderful, bright, bubbly sides of sustainability. I've even had two emails from journalists in the last week that have told me, we only want really simplistic, positive news stories around sustainability. I'm like, okay, cool, great. It was lovely to chat to you. No further business. I, yeah. I, I don't have the time for that. It's That's another form of greenwashing, and they're just absolutely so desperate to put something positive out there. You also wonder where the, you know, where the, where the funding is coming from higher up and where those, you know, where those requests are, for those kind of articles are coming from. And it's not about talking negativity. It's just about giving people the information that they can, they can have and they need to make the right decisions or make good decisions or feel informed. And I think it's what we've, what we've had for such a long time, as you know, is just this profit, this culture of profit at all costs, um, above environment, above humanity, above workers, above animals, above absolutely everything. And so that's why that's why people are silenced, and that's why. On the flip side, journalists are searching for positive stories because they need to make sales and they need to kind of they think about certain brands' bottom lines. Which is probably a good note to wrap up because um, I think let's let's listen to your call to action. I think I'd be really keen to hear what your your call to action is to to the people who might be listening to this. Um, I think we well come and join Extinction Rebellion. Uh, come and join us in the Fashion Action Team and hold brands to account and i think you know use this time that we have been having to sort of downtime a time of less um to really contemplate just exactly what what we do and don't need in our lives and what's important these these huge brands have had such power over us for such a long time you know these like mythical narratives of this of this promised land essentially that we are continually sold by big brands it doesn't exist and it's not going to exist in any kind of format in the future if we don't combat the climate crisis so you know really use that as a guiding light and if you're still unsure i mean google check out the news and there's so much information out there and like uh, wonderful greta thunberg always says you know we have to follow the science right now so I think that is the, that's my ultimate kind of call to action. We all have to follow the science. 
So thanks for taking the time, Alice. It's been such a pleasure. Um, if people want to find out more about you or what you're doing with Extinction Rebellion or your work with Central St. Martins, uh, where can they go to? Yes, so you can go to, for our fashion action work, you can go to xrfashionaction.com. It's all the information that you need to go and get involved there. And you can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter. I'm also going to be teaching again soon at St. Martins, quite possibly in the uh, virtual realm. And then we've got short courses over the summer and over the autumn term, but that can all be found on CMS short courses website. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I Thank know it's you. been so hard. It's such a tr trying time for all of us and uh, we're all recording this from our home. So <laughs> I'm really pleased to have you on board and I really hope that you've inspired some people to think about things slightly different at this time. So thank you very much, Alice. Thanks, Emma. A pleasure to chat to you as always. Cheers. Bye. Well, that's it for today. If you managed to get the entire way through this podcast without getting really annoyed by my bloody Australian accent, you deserve an award. For more information and to listen to the other episodes, go to vivobarefoot.com. See you later.